Hello, everyone. Welcome to this webinar titled Navigating the Pandemic, Design as a Career. I'm Siu Li from the Design Singapore Council, and I will be your MC for this afternoon. During this webinar, you can expect to be engaged in a lively conversation where leaders in the design, tech, and other sectors share their perspectives on how individuals can plan for their career in design, the opportunities for individuals who wish to pursue a design career, and the emerging and in-demand skills that individuals should develop to stay relevant in this post-pandemic era. Before we proceed, I would like to highlight a few things to keep today's session running smoothly. During this webinar, your microphone will be on mute. However, we welcome questions throughout via the Zoom Q&A function. When posting a question, please state your name and company or school. If you have a specific panelist whom you'd like to direct your question to, do indicate so as well. Should you encounter any technical issues, please reach out to our technical team via the Zoom chat function. We ask for your patience and understanding should conditions be less than perfect. I will now share with you the program outline, which consists of, firstly, an introduction to the event and the panel, a self-introduction by each member of the panel, the panel discussion and Q&A session, which will be the highlight of today. And last but not least, a resource sharing segment by the Design Singapore Council and the Lifelong Learning Institute, which covers the support available for individuals to further their formal education and skills development in design. Moving on to the introduction, we are pleased to share that this event is presented to you by the Design Singapore Council in partnership with the Lifelong Learning Institute and supported by the National Design Centre. Through this collaboration, we hope to raise awareness and interest in design, encourage a spirit of con continuous learning, and help our students and job seekers get a head start in exploring a career in design. You may also wish to note that this event is part of the National Design Center's Design Learning Program lineup for February 2021. As for the panel, we're excited to have Mr. Raya Lim, founding partner of QED Consulting, who will be moderating the conversation with speakers from both design and non-design companies, namely Ms. Crystal Chu, Creative Director of Kingsman Exhibits, Mr. Dale Newt, Head of UI Head of UX UI of Tomorrow Design Bank at UOB, Mr. Jason Goh, Design Director of the Experience Design Group at Dell Technologies, and Mr. Yong Jieyu, Principal Designer and Founder of Stuck. I will now pass the time over to Ryan and the speakers on the panel for them to do a self-introduction. Over to you, please, Ryan. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Ryan. As uh, Julie just mentioned, I am the founding partner of QED Consulting, as well as your uh, moderator panel, um, panel moderator actually for today. Um, can I go on to the next slide, please? So just a little bit more about me. Uh, I am a practitioner in de dealing with consulting work or in the areas of digital marketing and communications. Uh, I've been doing that for almost 20 years and I'm also a Skills Future Fellow. Next, please. Yes, I'm an entrepreneur, so I actually get to get very creative in terms of what I do, uh, especially with the consulting work and advisory. And I do a lot of uh, startup mentoring as well on the, on the side. So I'm literally a consultant by day, educator by night. I currently adjunct lecture at NTU as well as the Singapore Institute of Technology, uh, handling both their undergraduates as well as the master's program for communications. So a little bit about the, the, the company I work with and uh, what exactly that we do. Uh, we, are, we handle a lot of uh, marketing and communication roles and uh, issues. And we actually help organizations who invest in that particular space deal with their design as well as the structure of the organization, especially to be future-proof, to be resilient, and to also tap on and to leverage the opportunities that the digital landscape presents itself as well as to mitigate the risks that is usually associated with it. So our role actually covers quite a bit of design of the roles and uh, processes that comes along uh, where or when you're investing a lot of time and effort into the digital landscape and as well as digital marketing as well as communication. Now, that's all enough about me. I'm going to hand over to Crystal, who will then do an introduction about herself as well. Crystal? Hi, everyone. Good afternoon to you. I'm Crystal. I'm the creative director of uh, Kingsman um, Research and Design Team. We call ourselves uh, KRD. And you know, we are the creative arm of Kingsman Group. I hold an honors degree in museum exhibition design 
and graduated um, also um, from Tamasek Poly doing interior architecture and design. I have actually more than 21 years of um, experience in the design industries and my portfolios include multiple attractions of Shangri-La Group, um, galleries and museums for national heritage boards, theme parks for Universal Studios, as well as Experience Centre, Innovation Centres for Changi, experience, uh, Changi Airport Group. And uh, I am actually a member of Design Education Advisory Committee of uh, Design Singapore, Council, Ministry of Trade and um, Industry, as well as the members of Design Media Academic Advisory Committee at the Institute of Technology, Technical Education. And I participate uh, very actively and contributing some insights to Singapore uh, Design Education. Okay, next. Yeah, Kingsman Research and um, Design, the creative arm of Kingsman Group. We are a multidisciplined experience design studio and we um, have more than 200 designers connected across 10 studios in Asia Pacific and Middle East. We create experience and we develop deep understanding of underlying needs of the target audience. Next. And um, yeah, we um, create experience that bring people together. Next. And also, um, next, leave uh, lasting memories. Um, sorry, can you hear me now? Okay. And, uh, and moments that matters to them. We are storytellers and we believe that story is actually the most powerful ways to communicate. We create experience that immerse our visitors in spaces that engage them physically and emotionally. We are not just spatial thinkers, but we are designers who establish an idea with conviction. And we create experiences that, you know, that last a mem uh, moments and lasting memories for our end user. Okay, so who we are? We are um, a comprehensive suite of services uh, that all house under one roof. And our multidisciplinary design studio actually bring together architects, designers, branding specialists, as well as creative storyteller. And we create memories and uh, memorable experience for all different sectors, from museum and um, visitor centers to exhibitions and events, retail and corporate interior, as well as attractions and playscape. We believe that every brand has a unique story to tell. And you know, our role is to really make all these stories come alive. Next, please. So, you know, what is important to us? You know, our core philosophy is really the creative process that it must be human-centered. As such, we always seek to understand the needs, motivation, and behavior of the end user. And of course, how we do it, we always believe that the creative process is an integrated one. The synergy between design, content, as well as um, digital really allow us to conceptualize a very compelling experience. And next. So as a multidisciplinary team, we are able to think across in terms of integrated customers' experience across all touch points, content and storytelling, brand and spatial design, digital communication and personalization. We believe that all these experience help to shape and identify and create lifelong learning memories for our end user. So a little bit on some of the project that we've done. Next. Okay, um, I've actually just um, highlighted some of the key projects that we've completed recently. DHL Innovation Center on the extreme top left uh, in Chicago. It actually enables DHL to closely engage the customers as well as partners, industry stakeholders on the future of logistics in America. Changi Experience Studio on the right side top is telling a brand story using a travel guide working with RFID um, technology. Very exciting. Do have a look at uh, the jewel if you are available. It's, it's really a very exciting experience. And um, Bicentennial on the bottom left, it is bringing you back in time to witness the key moments of Singapore transformation more than 700 years and really identify and um, see the transformations of Singapore from as early as um, 1299. And uh, the right side is actually uh, Tencent headquarters in Shenzhen that articulate the future forward um, principle of the global vision. Next. 
Then we um, talk about um, nerve action experience, one of the most exciting projects that uh, Kingsman owns, as well as create right from the beginning. The entire experience is a nerve branded attraction that provide fun field experiences in this multi team arena. And of course, the Monopoly Dream um, on the left is also the first world attraction to bring Hasbro 2D board game, which everybody is familiar with, to light. And but by Shangri-La on the top right corner is actually an imaginative social experience play incorporated collaborative and educational play. And we believe that, you know, all these powerful moments doesn't just happen by chance. It is really for us to create. Okay, next. And yes, we are the creator of experiences and I hope we can share with you more of our experiences later during our panel discussion. So I'll hand over to our very inspirational and charming deal, the head of UX and UI tomorrow, uh, Digital Bank, you will be. Thanks, Crystal. Thanks for the introduction. Um, okay, uh, hi everyone. Um, so I'm Dale. I'm currently uh, head of the UX and UI design team for Tomorrow, uh, which is a digital bank uh, primarily aimed at millennials, and we're currently in uh, Thailand and Indonesia. Um, so, a quick backstory of, of uh, my background I've been working in the design industry for close to 18 years, and primarily on digital experience, and, and the industry has changed enormously during that time frame. Um, I've been fortunate to work for experienced design agencies and in house. Uh, mostly in-house, uh, in particular over the past 10 years. Um, I'm currently working in, I would say, the second industry I've been exposed to seeing what digital di disruption can actually do uh, for the better and certainly a great thing for, for the design community. Um, and, and, and I'd say the first time I experienced that dis disruption is when I worked for a news organisation, News International and The Times. And despite very different industries, I saw very similarities of where you really have to innovate and change because the competition and the environment and the quality of experience has improved so much, these organizations have to change within. And, and design is really a, a key kind of catalyst for that to, to take place. I've also been lucky enough to, to work in television. Uh, so I worked on for Sky, which is uh, a quite large TV uh, network in Europe and designing something similar to Netflix and also designing for mobile and tablet, and they all interact with each other. So a full ecosystem of, uh, of, of the way in which content can be presented. But what I want to talk about today is, is we're actually just focused about where I'm at the moment and the team that we're working with. And, and what really strikes me is that in, in this field of digital experiences and, and even the work banking world, designing a digital product, this is, a, in many regards, quite a golden age of design. And um, what I think is really interesting is as the industry's grown and matured, there are a lot of nuances to the roles. So I thought to share how our team is structured, just about the different skill sets and just a high level view of what they do, just to give a, perhaps that could be quite helpful for you to kind of see the various different types of design skill sets that now exist. Uh, so if you're able to move to the next slide. Uh, this not so great picture of me with a blue jumper on the right. Um, what is exactly is the design team? Well, we are a centralized design team. Um, it's quite a common model in a lot of organizations. So if you imagine, in my case, it's a, a digital bank. And the way in which you organize uh, the organization is, is around the different experiences. You could have a team from boarding, for banking, you could have a team to transact. Now, what design team is, is a service provider. So you're always looking at the end-to-end -end experience. You're always with the customer lens in mind, not just specific to an area. So your role is to articulate the ideas around the business with various different means, from the idea of research into executing. Um, also, collaboration is key with design. I think the days of design working in, in silo doesn't really work. It's really about having the cross-collaborative teams, different skill sets, working together simultaneously. So the picture on the right was when we did a design hackathon, and we often do that, and we do like our own little tailored T-shirts. Unfortunately, I didn't get the memo on that day. That's why I'm wearing this blue skimpy jumper, which wasn't my finest hour. But we have a, a very kind of fun, engaging, but hardworking kind of culture within, the, within our design team, which is quite common to, to find in, in design cultures in large organizations. If you move to the next slide, so I just want to just give a sense of what we deem as our kind of four pillars of design. So you have discovery, delivery, operations, and content. So discovery is really the term for your research to make sure that we're designing and building the right things for our customers at the right time. Delivery is more about the execution. So the design is that we're going to execute the interface, the journey, the visual aspects of it, all the functionality, the actual execution of the product itself. And then design oper operations, which comes from a thing called DevOps, which you may know of, 
which is really uh, an exceptionally important thing for design to ensure in a company where it's, it's a way of scaling design around the business organization with the right the tools and methods. So it isn't just design working on its artifacts in its own, but it's referenced around the business. So it's weaved into the overall organization. I'll talk about it a little bit more in a moment. And then content design. Um, you may have heard of marketing content writers. Uh, this is more experience usability content writing. And the difference is that is rather than writing aspirational content, you're really writing along the journey, the experience, writing useful, relevant, delightful content. That's part of the experience, almost like conversational design. And I think it's been a missing pillar to a lot of digital design over the past 10, 15 years. If you're able to move to the next slide. Thank you. Okay, so design discovery. Um, it's an incredibly broad church. Uh, you may hate uh, human centered design, design thinking, and really it's an array of uh, a, a site, um, quite a variant palette of different tools and methods to do your research. So it's very much about enable, educate, and empower. Now, discovery has been really key to actually driving design, having its seat at the table, becoming more empowered and organizations. And this has been a big shift. And it's one of the reasons why we need a lot of designers in this field. And really it's about how, let's say for instance, the business has an idea, but they have no idea what it means for a product. How do you get from a business idea to something that's meaningful to a customer, to a product in the hands? And really discovery is that first part, it's really understanding the human lens. Um, and, and as a design team, we facilitate that. But you create these cross collaborative teams where you bring people involved around the business and you take them through this process. So you get this shared understanding that design, you're also trying to educate the business how to understand from the customer's perspective. Uh, if we move to the next slide. You this great. So design delivery has said this is really about the execution. So if you're working for a large organization, if there's a new feature or a new product, a new experience, a small change, it comes to the design team. We have to make sure, is this thinking about the customer? How does this fit into the interface, visually and functionally speaking? And also about scalability. So when you're designing now, it's more complex. You've got to think about, is it right for the different markets? Is it going to translate well for different devices? It could be an Apple Watch, it could be a mobile tablet, it could be a standard web experience. You have to be able to design thinking about these things. If you move to the next page. So what is design operations I said? So this is really about how you mature the tool. So in a large organization, you have the business and different roles in that. You have design team, you have the developers, and you have what's called SIT and UAT testers, which is a way to make sure what's being built is correct. All these different functions need to have a reference of what is the kind of source of truth for design. So one is more of a mature process, but also there's a thing called a design system. Now if you're looking at a website or a phone or any different device, you're not really seeing isolated interfaces. It's a way in which you can build all the language, all the components and the patterns, and the way that could be referenced and used on all these different experiences. So it's really about a way which we can scale the execution of design. Now if we move to the next page. Thank you. So as I said, content design, this is a really key pillar. You can have the best visual designers, really well thought out UX designs, good research. But if you can't translate the content correctly, an experience just fails. So much of content design is understanding the voice and tone. So if you look at a large organization that successfully gets their content right, you feel that it's their voice. But it's not from just marketing aspirational talk. It's knowing where you are on the journey. What is the pain point? Where is the moment I need to be direct to you? When is the moment I need to be empathetic towards you? It's having that intelligence and working with the visual designers to know how to do that. And that obviously impacts the real estate of the screen as well. And also this is another branch of design empowering the business because this is also a way that we have to educate and facilitate around the business that different teams understand how to do that. And that's a great empowerment and value to design as well. So if we move to the next page. And be quick. So I'm just giving a, this is just a, a small example of a team, but I just wanted to share this to, to show the variety of different skill sets just within design. You have cross collaborative teams with more skill sets, but this is just looking at design. So design delivery, you have a design lead, you've got UX designers, which is obviously the looking at the overall experience and functionality taken from the research, UI designers, how to actually visually craft it. There is a lot of overlap and they do actually work side by side, not just left to the right. Um, and also UX research, which is really key to understanding the data, the customer insights for the research. And then we also have the design system team. You have someone who manages design ops, and then you have what we call design system designers, where they're the ones designing the system, where it's about execution and how you scale. And then what we have what's called UX engineers, and this is a rare breed of developers. 
you may find designers that also learn about code. This is really important. That their main focus is just about how the interface is built. So it's the bridge between design and how something is built and combining those two skill sets together and being embedded into the design team. So designers know what they can actually build for and then knowing how to be creative with the constraints that you have. And then the content design, we have a content strategist designer that would look at the customer journey map and work out how you actually draw the content correctly for that experience. And then you have content designers working with the UI designers and UX designers when they're creating the experience. And then this thing called visual testing. Um, when you're, uh, my experience when I was, um, you know, in education 18, 20 years ago, when, you know, you design in, uh, on your own accord and you finish with this design that you're happy with, from that point to getting into something that's built into a customer's hands is a rather different process. It's very complex and very challenging. So we have visual testers to make sure that they're regulating, governing that the fact that what's being built is actually in line to how we're designing an experience. So uh, I hope that's been uh, helpful and I hope that's been in the shortest time possible. Um, I'm gonna hand over to uh, Jason, uh, a very humble design director from Dell. Um, Jason here. So um, today we're going to talk a little bit about myself, my career journey, and also to help um, you guys can understand um, the Dell Design uh, Experience Design Group a little bit, and then what we do um, here in Singapore. Okay, um, currently I'm basically serving as a design director and also the site lead of um, the Dell Experience Design Group here based in uh, Singapore. So next slide, please. So just a little bit about my um, career. So I've been, always been in the in the kind of um, IT or or kind of uh, the consumer electronic um, the journey across my um, career. So start off with Panasonic in the early days where I kind of grew my kind of uh, hard skills, and then move on to um, Siemens Video where I basically start to kind of um, design a car audio products and then creative uh, technology, which is Singapore. I lead the um, the speaker design team uh, in creative and then move on to HP where I lead the um, Asia team for um, the printers division and finally uh, with Dell now basically leading the um, team here in Singapore. All right, um, next please. So uh, a, li a, a little bit about um, Dell design, right? So uh, we, we are basically a global um, design team that um, design everything under the brand of uh, Dell and also the Alienware as a gaming brand, right? So um, next slide, please. So so as um, as the comp as the team itself, we we kind of aim to de deliver and uh, enhance people's uh, experience and um, life um, through personal and also professional, right? So and and I think the design process itself is pretty kind of uh, uh, stringent from all the way, what, what we did was basically all the way from future, right? So we have an advanced uh, design um, team itself that basically looks at what's coming next, right? So it's always ahead of the game. So we have basically um, functions like um, cross-functional teams in um, de design, like for example, industrial design team. We have um, basically user experience. We have um, basically packaging design. Right, visual design, CMF, um, and also UI UX. So we kind of encompass the entire kind of design, multiple design function into one um, team itself. A hey, next, please. Thank you. Um, our group is basically um, located across um, um, the different regions, right? So from um, US being um, the headquarter of Dell, right? So in Austin, Texas, and a few cities in US. So we have groups in um, Amsterdam and so in Europe itself. And then we have um, two groups in uh, Asia, which is Taiwan and uh, Singapore. So all these teams itself is basically located to make sure that the, the, the design organization has to attract talents across the different regions, right? So, and, and we are so closely um, kind of need, right? And together as a team so that we could basically understand the different cultural differences between the different region across the group. Right, so this is, uh, I think that the, I, as the MMC and a big design organization, this definitely help us to kind of uh, uh, grow our point of view from different 
um, regions and also basically customer from different area right so and also attracting design talents all over the place and singapore itself um our focus here in singapore is really to um cross the best in that uh, best in class uh, dell products uh, and also the alienware products and then peripheral right so later i'll kind of walk through with you a little bit more uh, about the products that we design so uh, but i think first we want to kind of share with you a little bit about the team um, next slide please so this is this is uh the team here that um is responsible for how kind of crafting all the products under um, dell and uh, also alienware so the we always believe that um people are at the heart of uh uh, our kind of organization and the success of the company right so this is the the creative team um that basically helps to make um, their success um, in this area so and and we also kind of focus on having a more um, diverse team as well so if you can see um we, we kind of have talents over um the the different ethnic groups uh, from different countries and and also um, gender as well Right. So, and from this group itself, we have three different uh, kind of key functions, right? Um, from design management, industrial design, to user experience. So, so within uh, uh, the group here in Singapore. Uh, next, please. So, for the group in Singapore, we kind of focus on that. What I say, um, peripherals products uh, across Dell, global. Uh, we basically design a product that is sell globally. So let's uh, start with gaming, where right? it is more consumer focused. So gaming is one of the uh, key uh, part of um, the Singapore team as well, because we are responsible for crafting all the uh, gaming monitors that you see here uh, under the brand of Dell. On top of that, uh, we are also basically um, designing uh, the next slide, please, um, the, the Alienware uh peripherals as well so under the brand uh, i mean the gaming side of the business so if you look at uh, what the singapore team is responsible for this particular gaming experience so we are basically crafting things that um that's, gaming has a, a couple of things right like visual so the monitors itself base, basically give you that visual right so the audio right so the piece of the experience which is um all the gaming headsets etc that we are designing here in singapore and also um, the input and touch points that you kind of control your games, which is basically all the mice and keyboards, right? That we basically uh, design here in Singapore. So, so the portfolio of uh, all the peripherals like monitor, keyboard, mice, headsets, including um, soft goods like bags, um, like jackets, t-shirts, um, etc. Right. So it's designed here in uh, uh, Singapore as well. Uh, next, please. So the other part of um, kind of Dell. Um, the biggest part actually is on the commercial uh, portfolio. So Dell started off as a as more focus on uh, commercial, where we basically support all the company success in, in setting up their IT infrastructure. Right? So Dell, uh, in, like commercial monitors is one of our key focus here in Singapore as well. So we have been number one um, in market share for monitors for the past like uh, seven years. Right, so we, we continue to kind of lead the market in this area and continue to excel and differentiate ourselves from competition. So next, please. So this is a, a kind of overview of some of the commercial monitors that we, we kind of design here in Singapore. So not only the desk monitors, but also, um, for example, the next slide, um, you look at some of the conference room uh, ex uh, experience and monitors as well. So we do large format monitors that allow you to go uh, pen, inking, touch, and also compute into that uh, screen that you install in the in the uh, conference room in uh, offices. Uh, next, please. So on top of uh, the monitors itself, we are also in, uh, basically in charge of all the peripherals under the brand of uh, Dell. So peripherals means like things that is surrounding that PC. If you look at this image itself, um, the other than the PC laptop, uh, the the kind of power charging the running the laptop. The conference speaker adapter that you see there, mice and the pen, they are all designed here in Singapore, including the sleeve that you see at the bottom left corner, right? So that's all the accessories uh, that you see on all the on the right, uh, the naming, they are all designed here in Singapore, right? Uh, next please. So like what I say, like including um, soft goods, this is something that is uh, in, uh, pretty interesting to the team as well. So there's unique that we kind of um, have a, a unique team that uh, helps to kind of create a recyclable 
uh, materials uh, for bags, right? So, so all our, our hotel bags are basically uh, having this uh, eco loop um, kind of uh, trademark that is uh, more environmental friendly in the process of producing all these soft goods. So this is the part of the collaboration between, like I would say, with our CMF team and also uh, our design team itself to create a, a kind of eco friendly uh, soft goods portfolio. So next, please. Yeah, these are some of the the bags that we design. I think it, it kind of sum up the 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 whole um, like design products that uh, I mean the product design that we we basically do here in Singapore. So I hope to kind of uh, talk more and share with you more on uh, that uh, later. So with that, I would like to kind of um, introduce uh, Jie Yu, which is um, the principal designer and also the founder for uh, a local kind of design uh, team called Stark. Right? Hey, Jie Yu. Hi. Um... Yeah, thanks, Jason, for the introduction. Um, hi, my name is Jay. Um, good afternoon. And um, I kind of co-founded the, a company called Stark with a few friends 10 years back. So we are a design agency or consultancy. Um, and uh, Dell and UOP are actually some of, uh, some of our clients as well. Um, if you can move to the next slide, please. So we, um, we're homegrown. Uh, we started with three in an apartment. And today, we have a team of 30 over. Um, and it's a, it's a good mix now. So over the years, um, we all started with as, um, you know, product designers, but the team now has grown to have researchers, programmers, um, uh, we call them prototypers or thinkers um, and facilitators um, within the team. Um, and we have accumulated over uh, 100 over clients and more than 400 projects over the past 10 years. Um, I'll mix like this. So I've been pressing on my computer. Uh, for today, maybe just to share a little bit um, about um, maybe um, the career as well as personal journey, right? Um, and also the mindset that I have for um, career is that from career point of view, I think rather than to think that who will employ me or who will really, um, who should I join? Uh, I like to think from the angle of uh, who can I add value to? Uh, because with that angle, um, you, will never, you, you will never really have to uh, worry about employment at all. Uh, just to share a little bit about the design industry, I think the definition and value of designers have expanded quite a bit over the years. Um, and to illustrate all that, um, I'll just share with you the personal journey and Stark's career path in, in a sense, uh, in trying to constantly be relevant and create value for people around us and how that has um, changed over time. So if you can move to the next slide. Um, so this is where it all really started. Um, 10 years ago, um, three friends in an apartment um, we, we graduated, we had been working a few years, and we got back to Singapore, and at that time, um, we just thinking, maybe we should do something together. Uh, the reason why they don't look so happy in that picture is because I just beat them in winning 11 um, over a computer game. So, um, so that was how it all started when we came back, and, and we really thought of, um, because we were trained as industrial designers, which is uh, product designers, so we, we thought to come together and offer industrial design services uh, as a team. And looking back, uh, I think we would never have imagined the kind of projects that we will be doing today. Um, and it's really just guided by the kind of deep passion that we have about design and kept looking at how we can find relevance and use design to create value and impact for people. Um, if you move to the next slide. Um, so an example is this, uh, this is one of the recent projects that has been launched um, actually last year. Um, this is a typical product design project um, for a local client. And um, so this is what we do, bread and butter product design. Uh, the next slide. And over the years, um, as people understand the value of design and being upstream to create products that never existed rather than to shape a product, uh, we started getting a lot more innovation work. And how that differs is that um, there's a lot more upfront creation of a product that might not have existed. So it could be a new typology, it could be a new product that um, wasn't in the market before, and the company might have a certain technology that they might imbue into a product or for a value purpose, right? Um, so we call that innovation projects. We started getting more and more of that over the years. Um, next slide. And this started um, in 2007 when iPhone was launched and, you know, the, the whole apps industry started, um, you know, booming in that sense. And products were getting uh, more connected as they were called the IoT era, the Internet of Things. And that's where we started to build a team around capabilities to create um, products that can connect. And we started expanding uh, interaction team in-house to service some of our clients. Um, I think all of this grew rather organically. We're doing their products, so they came to us and say, hey, can you do our apps as well? Um, and that started the whole um, UI UX department or rather team uh, in Stuck itself. Uh, the next slide, please. 
more recently, over the past few years, um, design thinking has been picking up in um, locally, especially in the government sector. We've been always doing, uh, we've always been doing research for the MNCs, uh, the multinationals, which understand the value of research uh, to drive innovation. So we had always been doing um, product-driven uh, kind of research work in uh, different countries, in emerging markets in Indonesia, Thailand, uh, sometimes in the US as well. Um, but more and more, you will see that um, even government agencies, as well as um, retail or uh, service providers, they are looking at understanding the users or understanding people in general, and how can they carve out a strategy or guidelines or you know a pathway moving forward to maybe pivot their business or change the way that they work or create new products and services. So we started going to research and strategy. This is for um, early childhood education for preschools. So um, we're really proud of this project because um, that's where we actually get to define environments um, to create guidelines for architects and um, the government agencies to um, define how children environment or learning preschool learning environment should be. Um, the next slide, please. Um, and similarly, a similar project that defines um, kind of a new model of care for um, elderly nursing homes in Singapore, um, which is also a research plus ideation uh, and as well as strategy and guidelines um, for MOHH and URA. Um, and all these things couldn't happen uh, if design was not proliferated or uh, understood on, of the impact that it can create. And actually, these things were not done uh, in silo. This one, we had to partner with an architecture firm to uh, eventually be able to build, um, and they are building this uh, nursing home design right now. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this is something quite new, uh, about two to three years uh, new. And so as, as we move from just pure products into connected products, into um, technology um, kind of innovation, and then moving into understanding that research and upfront strategy was important, designers' role started expanding. Uh, and this was um, based on the connected um, experiences. Um, a lot of brands are realizing that um, typical uh, top of line marketing and advertising isn't working so well with uh, very experience driven uh, kind of pampered um, users, right? So we are very, very used to um, good experiences um, in the market. So this is where um, we started getting requests from clients to say, can you design my uh, point of sale um, uh, kind of tools or kits? so that uh, people can experience my brand. And sometimes their technology is good, but it's so hard to experience or explain because it's all embedded within the product. Like this, in this example, it was uh, for Nikon uh, SLO Crisol lens, which a lot of work and R&D went into the lens, but it's, it's just transparent. It's really, really hard to sell. So um, we started working with uh, demo toolkits uh, and we call them brand activations, where we started using our understanding uh, and innate skills of uh, creating ideas to work on how, how do you let um, someone experience the brand uh, in a different manner so that they can actually um, understand what, what, what you, are, you are doing or you're selling in that sense. Um, the next slide. Um, and along with all of this, um, we started um, thinking about, okay, how do we keep ourself, ourselves and our clients continuously um, uh, kind of um, interested or have a sense of wonder around the world? So um, we started building our own labs team. Uh, so we started um, uh, doing experiments and this experiment has, has no clients. Um, we started to uh, be our own clients and say, let's just react and create with um, whatever um, things that's happening today, the new technology or uh, the new issues that's, that's, that we are facing and uh, create interaction pieces um, to, to share with our clients, to share publicly as well as internally as uh, inspirational sources. Um, so all in all, I think this sums up um, what the company does and how we have shifted um, 10 years back, you know, when, when we were thinking we were just going to do product design. And that was really truly what we were thinking when we started the company um, and not thinking that we were going to, we were even wondering, will we survive the first um, three years at all as a business? Um, the next slide, please. Um, yeah, so this is my, my last slide. I thought I would just um, end off um, on this slide. And I think more and more people and organizations are understanding what design can do. And from a career or market perspective, I think it is a definitely an exciting place to be in, um, not only in Singapore, but around the world. Uh, I remember when I first wanted to study industrial design, my mom was still telling me that I might not be able to get a good paying job. Um, yeah, I was I was worried, but uh, I, I, it was what I, I, I liked. So I just did it, right? Um, and I think more importantly, the shift is that we should, especially with, with the world changing so fast, you know, what you need and what 
the context of the world is just changing so fast. I think schools are trying to catch up to train people or to educate people to provide vocational training that fits the world today. You imagine, right, four years career, uh, four years education plus, before your four years education was even there, there will most likely have been like three to four years of planning for the education. So it's a seven to eight years gap in between what the world today is and what the world tomorrow is. So um, it's not so much about what school has originally trained us for, but it's to more focus on how can I adapt, how can I edit my skills, how can I relearn, how can I transfer what I know to be relevant and create value for the world. Um, and because I think if you are really relevant and you can create value, you, you really don't have to worry about employment at all. People will come looking for you. Yeah, so I think that's uh, my last slide for today. Uh, thank you very much, everyone. Um, you've probably heard all the exciting things uh, that you've from, uh, shared by our panelists, and you notice that the career in design is definitely the, one of the possible opportunities that you can now explore. But as with our topic today, we want to know and explore design um, as a career, right? Not just as a job. And you probably heard from everyone that the career roles and paths for all our panelists today have actually evolved quite a bit from where they started to where they are right now. And if you look at it, we want to look at it from or with the lens of the pandemic, right? We are actually in, in the midst of it. We're trying to emerge out of it. And we want to say, hey, look, how do we actually stay relevant? And, and also explore what are the career opportunities and hear directly from all our expert speakers today. Not only that, we are hoping to maybe chat a little bit about what's the career path in terms of planning for a career in design discover what are the kind of skill sets that's actually needed as a, a result of it, especially you want to hear directly from the practitioners themselves, right? What they're seeing in the market space as well. And last but not least, also have some personal advice uh, from everyone. So now let me ask that most important questions to kick off this discussion uh, with among all of us, right? What is the career trend that we're all seeing? Because it seems to be have been evolving quite a bit from all the panelists and all of you that have just shared, right? from where you were back then and to where it is right now. Well, where are we heading towards for design professional? And maybe I can just start it off by directing this question at Crystal. Crystal, what do you think? Where are we heading towards? Okay, so being uh, the, the rose among the thorns, <laughs> I'll start <laughs> off. <laughs> this. Hmm. Okay. Um, so the career trend is actually very inspiring. You know, it's like uh, like what uh, it was shared. You know, we really believe that um, design has actually it's just more than creating a aesthetic environment. Now, we believe that it's now transforming business, raise quality of life, connect people. You know, drive innovation, create new values, and design is not just a skill. It's really a mindset. You know, help us to respond to the disruption. And, and you know, we are tasked now not just to assist uh, our client to create uh, beautiful architectures, but we help our client to solve problem, to capture new market. Mm. You know, it's like the, re, uh, the, the projects that we're working with, you know, the attractions project when we're working on Shangri-La Bats, we were involved in helping them to, to create um, the activity within the space, to work out their business plan together with them on how to bring in more families staycation group within the business hotel and we were all part of the whole um, brainstorming process of making the business work and especially with this new COVID world you know we designers have to rethink the way we work the way we we live the way we do our business and you know it is it's a lot and you know there's a whole new world of new experience for us to design so a, a lot of potential for design right, professional right. now yeah Dale, any, any thoughts? Where are we heading towards? Well, I think first of all, where it was before, where it's now is hugely different. I agree a lot with what Crystal was saying. I think that the days of design teams being a reactionary kind of team that just delivers visual aesthetics has very much come to an end for multiple industries. Uh, and yeah, and it's it's driving business decisions. And it's it's no longer, uh, in fact, it's, it design has become so important, so valued that it's, it's too important just to belong with the designers. So a lot of designers now is knowing how to facilitate all these ways of working and all the methods that we have around the business as a whole. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, the I think the skills become, there's more titles existing, there are different types of roles existing in design because it's scaling up to such a uh, size now. And what, what really strikes me, I mean, I, I guess I'm biased from being in more digital design for some time, but it's still experience design, it's still design thinking. Um, is is the, we still a struggle to to find people with the expertise to fill the gap in, in what we need in our teams? You know, I, I generally believe this is a golden age for design. 
And I said, it is a mindset as well. It's driving business decisions. It's driving what defines a good experience. It's bringing the ethical questions into what design should be about as well. I mean, it's changing business collectively as a whole. And, and it's a space a lot of people want to get into. And if you don't adopt uh, a design thinker, you some design, and you're not really seeing it from that lens, you're, you're, most, you're, you're running the risk of coming out with a less quality outcome with whatever you're creating. And, and the competition will see that and customers will recognize that. The benchmark has risen so much now. So the need for uh, more practitioners and design has just only grown and significantly mm -hmm. over the past five years. Now, if I may, right, has the pandemic sort of given it, this design profession a bit of a speed bump or a speed boost? To me, yeah, I, I would say, well, obviously I'm working for Digital Bank right now, so the sense of dropping <laughs> and the currency has become more important. So, yeah, definitely. Um, I think just the ways of working, digital products, are already digital experience are always uh, kind of progressing quite strongly, but it's just accelerated that for sure. Right. Um, Did Jason, do you see the yeah. same thing? Yeah, I think definitely accelerating. I mean, I'm, I'm in the IT business. <laughs> so so I think we, we, I mean, and as an IT company, Dell has been always basically promoting like a seamless uh, working experience, right? So be it whether you are in, in different countries or locations, you, you have the capability of connecting um, this whole um, experience or the, the workforce itself. And then this pandemic has just accelerated the adoption of basically um, um, remote working, working for anywhere right, uh, concepts, right? And I IT infrastructure itself is basically the thing that basically tie in all those stuff that allow people to go do that, right? So I, I do see that, I mean, in Dell, we do see that yeah, it kind of accelerated the, the whole uh, need for um, the, the experience through pan pandemic. So has, has it evolved any, or where do you, where do you see that trajectory have going towards when it comes to the design profession? Right. So from for us, um, like, for example, we have kind of moved some of our, our design um, so-called uh, tools. Like, for example, um, now with um, the kind of everyone not able to uh, uh, share contents or basically um, touch the same thing or look at the same thing, we have kind of evolved, like, for example, from a physical to a digital um, design review with AR, VR, for example. Right, so you, you kind of um, use technology itself to kind of replace some of the the kind of um, not say traditional way of looking at physical stuff, but basically serving the same purpose. We are using technology to go support um, all these activities. Right, yeah. and then uh, I I want to direct this question to Jiu. By the way, Jiu, you have to remind me after this to ask you for your prototype coffee machine. Uh, you, I, I enjoy the coffee and I want like aesthetically pleasing and I'm assuming that the coffee will taste just as good. Um, but I, I've seen, right, what you just shared from your introduction that you've gone on from very basic uh, work into that, all into product design, evolving all the way down to designing uh, the locations as well as uh, designing as an experience. I mean, you seem to be evolving a lot, very, very great, huge changes and very integrated to the business. Where else? What's next? Are we going to design dreams as well? Um, no, I mean, my bet is going to be on experiences. Um, and I think it's um, like we were just talking about Clubhouse, right? Um, or TikTok, right? right? Um, and I, I think it's where the experience is going to be. Then the demand will, will, will follow, right? Um, and that's where you need a little bit more subject matter knowledge and, and skill sets to go into that area. Um, mm -hmm. And, and I think it's not not something that I think when we think about a design designer, it's not some individual, but it's, it's a team. Uh, and um, as we were saying that, I think um, Dale pointed out that it's, it's expanding, right? It's expanding and therefore the, the, the scale and the roles that it, it has carved out is quite quite varied right now. So I think there's no one way to define that, but it's really about that dynamic and, and, and five varied roles that's being carved out because of the new demands of design. So um, what's next would really follow on um, where the experience lies next. If the frontier of experience lies in audio, if the frontier of experience lies in uh, virtual, then I think that's where the next big demand will be. Um, but I'm also betting on authentic interaction and experiences simply because we are fundamentally human. Um, so an example, when you ask about the digital acceleration and if you ask where the money is, definitely digital is in huge, huge um, uh, gap, a, a gut, you know, or rather that there's a huge demand for UI UX designers and programmers simply because that's where the trend or the, the experience is moving towards. Um, but um, they also 
there's also a another another point of view about um, people uh, craving more for authentic human interactions and experiences. So that's another right. point where um, like retail is trying to reinvent themselves, service providers, um, uh, physical you know uh, businesses are also trying to reinvent themselves. And that's also another big area that um, design is going to be needed. So I think it's going to flourish in uh, multiple areas and not just in one area. Yeah. Yes, and this is actually taking into context where uh, of the pandemic, right? Where everyone has to rethink uh, and redesign themselves, or rather reinvent themselves as well, and, and try to figure out what's the new mode of actually going forward. Would I be right to say that? Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah. Uh, Jason? No, I think, I think the. <laughs> The, the, no, no, I think the key thing is more we we we, I mean for from uh for us we we kind of basically see that coming right in the sense we we are in the third phase we call it the third phase of um, digital transformation, right? So right. in the in the past it's really kind of uh, one at a time, meaning all computers don't talk to one another. You you are more location based. Uh, you you kind of work from one area and you, you just work from there and you go home. You don't work, right? So all the way to to current um trend of technology that is where he's bringing us is more collaborative it's more kind of uh, ubiquitous and stuff right so so those trend actually from our that's why i was saying the team that we have here is always kind of looking forward to what's next so that was the trend that we basically kind of see um like three years ago we started to kind right. of uh, put that it together and say, hey, in the future, this this will be the trend that is going. And then we, as we build our way to it, and then just like what I say, pandemic just accelerated. So now things are a little bit more connected. They are, the blending between digital and physical environment uh, is, is more now, right? So it's going to just mix. Uh, the reality is just going to mix between digital, physical. And then and that that is basically where we're heading right, right. towards. I mean, I, I've, I've, I noticed that there was a very interesting question that came out. Maybe I can just pose this over to all of you here. Uh, because it, it seems that with the roles expanding, I think Dale mentioned that the roles are evolving and there are more and more different roles that is required to put together into a team rather than having an individual. So are we heading towards more like the generalist kind of... A, uh, are we leaning towards being generalists or are we leaning towards more being more specialist uh, roles when it comes to design professions? I, 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 I know my view is, is, is the answer is, is I don't think it's the back of my answer to that. It's a combination of all. I think um, one of the reasons why collaboration is becoming so key is because now we have more specialist roles involved. However, when you're looking at things, human said design, design thinking, whatever terminology you put to it, it's really about understanding why customers are using the thing they are, what moments are there, what value it brings. So whether you start off as a UX designer or you're working into UI or some other uh, design skill set, primarily you're thinking in the same approach. So there's an awful lot of overlap. Um, and I think so, so naturally, if you want to become a design leader, you have to have a, a general knowledge about design and being able to communicate what design is to the business and be from different area, different skill sets outside the design community. Um, and I think also um, what, what you are mentioning earlier about the fact that at the moment there's a lot of uh, need for digital design. But you could be a UX designer in, in reality that you're not really about designing the interface or I'm going to build a mobile app. It's more about understanding what that experience is. So it actually translates to a lot of things. So I, I see a lot of people going into the uh, design industry, perhaps starting off as a UI designer, perhaps goes into UX, perhaps goes into content design, perhaps goes into design strategy or moves up moves up the chain into more upstream of what design could be. Um, so yeah, I think you start off being more specialist, but I think once you start getting exposure of this collaborative culture, you tend to grow into different roles and you tend to get more involved in a lot of things right. across the experience. Do, do you think that there is actually like an opportunity for two tracks where you can go specialist uh, and uh, generalist as well at the same time? They, can they coexist? Um, uh, I mean, I guess it's, sometimes you can join a design team and, and your choice is that you want to remain a person of craft, where that's where you get the real enjoyment. It's actually doing the design itself. And then perhaps you become a specialist in a certain area, but if you want to choose to uh, you know, try and push design in an organization, then you have to kind of expand. So I think right. going general could be more be in a sense of becoming design leadership but, but even in a person's craft, you still would expand your skill set, but perhaps you, you select a specific area. Really then varies. maybe I can, 
I can pose this question to Crystal as well, right? Uh, in your capacity, I mean, which one would you be hiring more of uh, in the next couple of months? <laughs> the generalist or the specialist? Both, actually. I mean, I, I honestly think that uh, um, it is like this, this whole COVID uh, pandemic situation has to be has accelerated innovation and, and has accelerated business transformation. And you know, we are now living in a in, in a new era where the world is changing faster than, than ever. And um, I don't think that's really just a specialist anymore. It's that right. we really have to um, equip ourselves and really uh, adapt and stay relevant, be really quick in in adapting. Like uh, what Dio says, it's all about your mindset. You know, it's like how we, we, we communicate. We, we're still designers who communicate our thinking, our mm -hmm. strategy behind to our end user. So it's you know, all sorts of different mm -hmm. experiences that comes in. I mean, basically, we still want to, to achieve as much as we can. So um, whether we are designing a old folks home or a, 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 a kid's childcare center, it is all working out of the day for the end user. So it is really, um, basically, we, we have to be specialized in just creating that experience that we right. mentioned earlier. I mean, I have this uh, interesting thought, right? I mean, now that there seems to be a there, the there is a demand, but there is an insufficient supply, and I'm sure that given the more creative side of the business, there will always be freelancers, right? The lone gun who is passionate, develop the skill sets themselves. Do you see this as a more like, for example, outsourcing or partnering some of these individual uh, specialists? who are out of guns for hire? Or do you think that it's more like something that you want to hire within or to get someone within the organization as a, as a team to work with you? I mean, maybe I can throw this question over to JU as an agency who is doing that. What, what, what's, the, what's your thought on this? Is it, would you partner as a, a freelance specialist or would you prefer to hire it in-house? Um, yeah, so um, post-COVID, right? Um, um, our team has mostly been working remotely. So, and even prior to that, we have been very open with to partner with um, freelancers and um, or even other agencies, um, be it locally or overseas as well. Um, so that has always been in our DNA. Um, but I think the the decision on whether we are to keep it as a core team or use it as a, a as a partnership would depend on um, the core offering that you are giving, right? Um, so at the end of the day, it will, it will be like, do you need to utilize this um, um, kind of cap, um, um, you know, skill set or does that um, you know, synergize more things within your company to have it in-house? Then that's the decision where should we bite the bullet and hire? Uh, or do you need it as um, kind of like an injection of creativity or a supplement of skill sets or capabilities that you're uh, team is missing, then we use that as um, a freelance uh, basis. And sometimes we even use that as an education basis. But we know it's um, um, the project budget might not have afforded a, a good freelancer on this project. We would still have uh, hired one just so that our team can learn from the, the, the experience of the freelancer and the different perspective that's external as well. Um, so right. it really depends on a lot of um, criteria. Right. And Jason, do you hire or, or partner? I think we do. We do both right so but the the key yeah i think the the key thing is more of the specific skill set that you need at that point of time right some of the skill set that uh um, or expertise that you kind of need them might not be uh, for long term it might be uh, for a specific project you need uh for, for example a program programmer to come in and help you with certain things right so and then you can hire them as a freelancer to come in there but there, there's definitely a core competency that we we establish in within the organization mm. itself Right, so mm -hmm. to help run the day to day, and then we inject um, kind of creativity with uh, uh, with consultancies or even freelancers that comes in and help us kind of take a different pers uh, perspective, right? Inject in with a uh, new or creative uh, perspective into the the design process, right? So, but we do feel that the challenge in in Singapore is uh, uh we, we it's hard to find freelancers. <laughs> <laughs> my, uh, with, with, with my with my colleagues in uh, in Amsterdam, they were like nobody wants to work uh, as permanent staff. Everybody mm -hmm. wants to work as a freelancer so that they could have flexibility in time, and they are also working for multiple company for multiple projects. Right? But in Singapore, I, uh, oh when my. we always uh, try to find freelancers, it's, it's tough. <laughs> I, 
you know, I want I want the kind of dream job like the digital nomadism, right? I want to do the freelance work for you, but drinking coconut juice in some Bahamas somewhere while you no know, working for a corporate job at the same time, right? And if I'm stressed out and I need inspiration, I can go down to the jungle, canoe a little bit, <laughs> inspire and come back to do my job. <laughs> okay, so I think I, I, yes, Neil, yes. I was just saying, I think one of the reasons why. Uh, I mean, if you're designing a digital product, it's no longer about you design something, it's done, it's shipped, completed. It's always ongoing, it's always iterating. So that's why when we use agencies, uh, we tend to have it more embedded now. They're part of the actual team. They don't feel as though they are a contractor. But as Jason was saying, sometimes it could be a specific thing that you need to upskill on and then you use a freelancer. Um, right. But also found the same issue, very difficult to find um, you know, experienced freelancers in Singapore. Ah, so there's an opportunity for everyone listening in, right? So skill, skill up and be employed and you'll be extremely valuable and hopefully reach along the way too. <laughs> now, I, I think all of, all of you here today uh, are actually coming from a reasonably large size organization. And I'm sure that the organizations, the corporate organizations, the large ones have really recognized the value that design as a profession has uh, for the organization at the business level. But what about, I, I'm not sure, but have you ever encountered or spoken to people uh, who are working or looking at the small and medium enterprises themselves? Do they value design as much? And what are the, some of the challenges that they face when convincing them of the value of design to a much smaller uh, organization? Is there anyone who can share a little bit about this? Jay, I think how do, you, do you see a lot? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Oh, Jason, uh, right. Yeah, Jason, I think yes. that, 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 that's, that's something that I wanted to kind of uh, 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 yeah, say as well. Because I think even from uh, my, my friends in the consultancy industry, we, we, they do see that there's a, there's a high uptake of uh, um, kind of SMEs trying to kind of uh, uh, bring in design into their organization. Right. So by, by basically uh, cons uh, engaging a consultancy to, to work with them because they don't have an uh, in-house team to go set it up. Right. So especially with my, my um, consultancy friend in China, they do see a, a growing kind of needs of uh, SME coming in and say, hey, I need, I need design uh, uh, services for my, my company. I need them to kind of help uh, boost up the, the, the product um, and the design the experience itself. Right, so so that's why that I do see that booming. Yep. Yeah, so the SMEs can, are, um, can can say yeah, more. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yes, please. I was like, uh, uh, this is uh, this is always quite a heartache problem for us actually. Um, I think, <laughs> it, yeah, it's, it's really on relevance. Um, I think by nature of the business, um, mom and pop SMEs right have a very short um uh, kind of planning ahead. And the budgeting is also very tight. So when that's why I say design is really varied, right? It really on depends on where you're operating at. Um, and with the, it also comes to a point where there, there is a point where you might or might not be ready to use design or that this agency they are looking at is not suitable for your needs. So it's about relevancy. And uh, we have a lot of clients that actually come to us. And what we do is we actually refer some of our friends or some of our um, um, you know, fellow um, design agencies to them and say, because what you're looking at will actually not cost effective for you. We are actually costing you money. So we'll tell them, go to this one and they're really good at what you need. And, um, you know, they'll get the thing done for you. Um, so I think it's really about that. Um, I don't think it's that they don't value design, but the at the end of the day, um, the kind of impact that they're hoping to, to, to make uh, to their business uh, can be very specific. And then therefore the a specific agency will fit them. I mean, having right. said that, we do we do see a lot of second and third generation SMEs, um, you know, inheriting from uh, their fathers or family, their business, and want to transform the business because, um, you know, to, to the way they work, digitalize it, or you know, create new services. Um, and then those are the medium or slightly larger size SMEs that would be more ready to embark on certain um, kind of uh, more risk taking design work in that sense. So it really depends. Uh, but, but SME is really. Uh, rising and I think um, the government is also trying to help out with giving out grants for that as well. Yeah. Right. Crystal, is there anything that you have encountered with the SME clients or prospects that you have deal? Is there any difficulty or friction trying to convince them of the value or quantify the value of investing in design? 
I, I mean, I think uh, what Jay mentioned is uh, is right. You know, sometimes they do have uh, issues on uh, budget, but however, you know, I think they are already. I, I think there is a, a good progress. They are seeing that design can actually really add value and transform their businesses, and they have to continue to really focus on the the growth and transforming themselves. So it is we're getting more and more uh, requests from this SME um, because they all believe um, that design, uh, good design set uh, a product their own product apart from their competitors. So that's when they, they come to us and uh, they are willing to, to invest. And, um, and that's, that's actually uh, definitely uh, growing compared to uh, a couple of years back. But then how do you quantify something so qualitative to say that there is true value? I mean, how should anyone try and go about justifying it to say, for example, that yes, what I'm doing has quantified value, I'm bringing great returns for the organization as a whole, and I'm contributing uh, largely to the success of, the, of an organization that you're part of, or maybe the people that you're working for. How do we go about that, especially in the well, world of design? It, well, from, from a, a small business perspective, um, I think one thing is that you can de-risk the ideas. I know de-risk doesn't sound very exciting, but um, <laughs> I think if the mindset is there, there is tools and, play, and processes now that you could take an idea in its infancy, get it into prototype, get it in front of customers. Uh, I once witnessed a, a small company that had a good investment, really talented developers, and they're very passionate about they wrote their code. And they invested this, I think invested six months building something that wasn't comprehensive to a customer. And then they said, we need to rebuild it again. They went in the second wave and they still didn't do it. And it was again, not relevant to a customer. Now, even if they invested four weeks, just four weeks, I'm not saying that's the ideal time, and they went through like a lean kind of design process where quickly, rapidly taking the ideas, understanding the journey, getting into prototype, test the ideas. They would have seen a lot of the fundamental flaws in the design and the money they would have saved and for the benefit of building a better experience at a shorter period of time would have been significantly different. So that's something that's very easy to, to be measurable. But again, it goes to the mindset in that whoever's there, do they have an openness towards it? Are they willing to, to kind of take on these ways of working? Um, but in the sense of measuring design, um, it, it is obviously harder to measure design in, say, more traditional areas of business. But there are many ways that, that you can do it. Again, it's really variant on what you're trying to measure. So there could be a generic measurement, let's say sales, for instance. But if you're designing something, different experiences require different forms of measurements. Um, and there's multiple ways you can do it. We use things called an MPS, which is just getting a sense of what's the overall feel of the experience. You know, if you're looking at the data, you could look time on task, what is the error rate? Um, and then you can use other forms of usability testing as well, so validating your ideas. So there are a lot of methods that you can use and other forms of data, um, but it's really relative to what you want to test and what part of the experience. Right. But it's a very good uh, question. If you can measure design and present it back into metrics to people from business, it gives you a, a lot more drive in the business and you can get a lot more buy-in. I, I wanted to ask Jason this question because someone is more on product design and I saw that you are designing a lot of these Dell bags. Do you sell more computers because you've got a great design coming out from your bags? <laughs> <laughs> I, I've got to ask you this, right? right? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> uh, yeah, I, yeah. I, I do hope that in, in, there will be one day where people buy a computer because they want that bag. <laughs> 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 No, I, well, I think, it, yeah, it is that, possible. Yeah, it is possible, right? <laughs> LV bag yeah, comes no, with a computer, we, a laptop. <laughs> I think I think we do we do see that that sometimes like people do buy the bags without a computer. So so like because like ah. we, we basically sell it like especially especially um, Alienware for example as a gaming brand, All right? So it, it, like instead of basically um, I'm buying a Alienware PC and stuff, some some. Of them actually likes um, the accessories like bags, uh, mice, and etc. Right, t-shirts, uh, jackets. We do we do see them, right? So selling uh, accessories without a computer. Yes, that's why we have that's, that's why we have an accessories business. <laughs> I, I, I have a personal experience once. Uh, someone actually, uh, this guy was probably one of those uh, rare few, right? He actually bought a, a phone cover, which was more expensive than the phone. So I'm like trying to figure out who's protecting what, actually. <laughs> and so I realized that design does make a hell of a lot of difference too. <laughs> right, right. Well, I, I mean, I wanted to ask, right? Uh, the other parts about uh, in agencies, right? Agencies uh, versus in-house 
uh, design as a profession. How different is it? I mean, is is it is it better or is it different? How how? I mean, I mean, Jeju is from the agency side. You're designing for someone, which are generally means that the IP you have to transfer it to somebody else, except for those that you you commission yourself. And versus those that you design for in-house for an organization like uh, Jason and and Dale and I think Crystal, you partner and you design some yourself as too, right? I, I'm assuming is that correct? So mm -hmm. is there a dif difference uh, yeah. between Crystal? Maybe mm -hmm. would you like to try? Not, uh, um, not yeah, they are not exactly the same. Um, actually, but you know, of course, both regardless of whether it's an in-house uh, focusing on a certain experience or whether we are reaching out to. Um, other brands it is still to assist to to create a meaningful and memorable and of course measurable I think that's also what very important to to be able to measure the experience like what we, we mentioned earlier so uh, agency of course they are just focusing on the brand um, I, I used to be actually working uh, in OSIM and you know I'm, I I, mean, I don't design a such chair but I actually create the, the retail experience for, for 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 OSIM and it is uh, very focused really just on the uh the, the retail experiences you know every products that comes in we have to we have to um design and uh you know transform the retail experience to fit to to suit the product so that the whole um the whole experience is is much better and of course for um for you know uh, agency we we reach out to a variety of clients from multiple brand, brands very diversified group of uh various clients from uh, SME to to uh, to um, you know, international um, client, there is a a, a big uh, disciplines and um, mm. yeah, it's actually um, pretty different for sure. Right. And of course, a lot more exposure when it comes to um, dealing with uh, a group of uh, multiple brands. Yeah, right. And maybe I can just ask you to to give us a little bit of his thought on this uh, in in house versus agency and then after that we can shift gears to asking you for your personal advice i think there's quite a bit of questions coming in from that area um you're asking okay. about the difference between in-house and uh, agency designers yes from your point of view um i think i think they are primarily the same the the only difference is that uh, you have one client um versus uh, multiple clients but the the base process is is transferable. It's basically trying to understand what your client needs, what the project um, goal and outcome is, and then structure a process that uh, that gets you there. So, um, although as an agency, uh, as a designer in a in a consultancy or agency, you get multiple projects, multiple clients, but the, the end thing is is the same. You start with scoping, framing, and understanding what is required, uh, how you get your client there. Um, so, for me, fundamentally, it's the same. It's just a matter of do you like to design. I have a friend who. Uh, I, I used to be in an agency where the senior was designing HP printers for, for like ten years. So even in an agency, you can be assigned to a client for ten years. So it really depends on on your own preference. I feel. Okay. Thank you. May, uh, maybe I can switch gears a little bit, right? I, I think I would like to talk about the uh, how to get into this particular space. I mean, we've talked about what the opportunities are. I want to focus a little bit about your personal advice. How what kind of skills do you need when you want to get started in the UX and UI space? Especially, okay, so let me put a bit of context. Mid careers, not just when you're coming out fresh and then you can learn everything, right? And you've got a lot of space in your brains to be able to pick up a lot of skills and stuff. For mid careers, if you're trying to switch and to go into UX, UI, how would you advise someone trying to do that to come into the design profession? Uh, question to me. Um, well, okay, so it, let, so the question is this if you want to first go in, or you're midway in your career somewhere, but you want to pivot into UI, UX. Well, well, the first thing is that um, the, the technology is so accessible now that you can design things on your own accord. So if you have an idea for a product or an experience, you can do that. You know, you can use tools like Figma, Sketch, Envision to prototype. And really look at, if you haven't looked at human-centered design and design thinking, I'd really encourage to look at these methods and processes and think about some idea. Perhaps it's something you're pa passionate about. In fact, that's better if there's something that you really thought about it and you've got an idea for a digital experience or it's a mobile app or website or even an Apple Watch, however you choose it to be, and go through that process. And, and the most important thing is to really show your thinking to it, how you came to the ideas, how you validated it, where did it come from, and then building an actual prototype. So if you've got visual skills already, understanding how an interface is built, how to use that space effectively, 
And then if you have a prototype at the end, what even be even what, what certainly get my attention is if you then took that in front of customers and you see how people interact with it. And something that's a real penny drop moment if you're designing anything for a customer. When you're really close to something and you become more knowledge of the craft, and you think, oh, this is beautiful, this works, and then you put it in front of a customer and something you thought was fantastic doesn't even make sense to them. And, and going through that experience and then seeing how somebody uses the prototype, just seeing the design again, and having that type of narrative and story is a great piece for your portfolio. So I think you can use um, easy tools to create a website and portfolio to be tailored upon UI and UX, and just really just go out your way, build your own experience, and build your own prototype, really with all these areas to really show your, your thinking. And, and your thinking behind it, your problem solving is a real key part. And that's what I'm really curious when, when I look for new stuff. Um, but there's awesome. lots of community, online communities out there. Get out there, meet people. Uh, there's different forums that takes place. Get in part of the community and get involved. Right. Uh, Crystal, I mean, you're into a space of designing a lot of experiences as well. How, how do you think people should get started? And what kind of skills should they pick up first? Is there any direction that you want to point people to? Um, of course, uh, for for our industry, you know, it's like uh, the, the design education, they will have like, you know, in um, the education in a degree or, or, or diploma in a interior architecture, industrial design, visual communication, design communications and all this, uh, architecture, creative art, UX, UI. I think that is um, some of the foundation that uh, we, we look out for designers, but ultimately, regardless of which other industry, because we are very diversified, we we create experience for various client in a in a very um very uh messed uh um various experiences so it is really to adopt a mindset of continuing uh, transforming adapting and innovating um so that is uh important by like what i mentioned you know is design right. thinking is really just the, on the mindset so um being mm. innovation you know if, being innovative is no longer just nice to have it's actually absolutely necessary to have for designers today so um yeah regardless of that basic training i think most important is still to to this um the design mindset that the creative mindset that we might we must have to, in this right mindset. so if someone is, may not have that kind of uh, qualification just yet, is it possible to actually show from some of the related industries, like say someone's uh, maybe a fashion designer who suddenly says, maybe I just don't want to go fast fashion anymore and I would like to actually do design of experiences. Would that would this be something that to be considered seriously as well? Yes, yes. We actually have designers um, from various disciplines, uh, whether they are uh, fashion designers or product designers or, you know, um, in fact, we do also have a lot of um, people in the studio who are not design trained, but they are so creative. Oh. So right. it is an interesting, you know, and um, and uh, that is where we what we are looking at. Based on end of the day, we are um, we are a group of innovators who really create values for our client, and it's that type of training, the tough, uh, innovative, and sh a strategic mindset that help us to, to reach out to the end user. So it has been a very mm. diversified uh, market, but of course, you know, uh, from there, it is really the, the exposure as well as the the mindset that we we have all this uh, group of um, creative people that comes together to, to collaborate together to, to find the best um, solutions for us and our customers. Right. Well, Jason, what about you? What kind of qualities would you look out for? I mean, you've got a quite a, I think, sizable team, right? It's, a, it's, it's actually team based, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So I, I think really, basically, based on the question, the original question you were talking about, like how, what, how do you basically transit mid career? into uh, different kind of design uh, competencies, right? So like in, in Dell itself, or even in, in a previous, com previous company like HP, so we do have um, like basically a career switch within the company, right? So and Dell is an international, I mean, a multidisciplinary organization, we, we do advise that, right? So uh, that you could basically switch your career within the specific company or within the specific team. Right, so there are two two things. First thing is more of um, you need to kind of get your core skills, right? So that there, there's definitely a, a layer of core skills for UI UX. You need to have basically like Figma and all those uh, tools that you, you kind of use it, right? As a as a basic um, uh, kind of a UI UX designer, you need to to kind of build your core skills first, right? So and then experiencing and creating uh, um, like. Uh, uh, what Dale has mentioned, right? So, so basically, go create, right? So, experience it. So, usually in in Dell, we will basically 
have mentorship and stuff that basically help designers that that uh, transit into um, the roles that they want to be in the future as part of their career planning, right? So um, yeah, basically the skills and also the, the mindset itself has to kind of switch. Right, and then, and then, and just what just a quick wrap up for the final question. I think that's the important one, right? Ultimately, whatever we're doing, we're looking for the mark of success. So one of the questions I have is that how would you measure that you have been successful in your design career? Can I pose it to all of you? A quick shot, one or two liners before I hand it over back to the team at DSG. Successful meaning? I, I, I think the, the most successful experience that I have is always when the, the customers, uh, when you look at customer feedback and, um, and all the kind of reviews and stuff, that all the design thinking that you actually put into the, the product itself it's basically came out from the voice of that customer, right? So, so right. to me, I think that 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 feels uh, that we, we did a good job in basically translating that uh, into a customer needs. Thanks, 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 Jason. Dale, I think I'd probably say if if you, similar, if you created a product that exceeds what the customer expected of the product and entailed actually new behavior, I think that's when you've really driven design to actually change somebody's life in some form from a Team perspective, building a team that's actually collaborative and is actually generating good work that goes to the product. Right. I, I like it. Design of new behaviors. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's a new one. <laughs> I, I like that. I, I, I'm, very, I'm very at the moment, but I'm yet I'm very intrigued by it at the same time. Crystal, what about yours? Mm. So for me, the uh, really to create a memorable. Uh, experience for our customers i mean it's like some uh you know an experience that will touch their heart i think that was the probably um you know the, the most successful things that we have done um for our customers and they keep coming back to us i think that is the most important and we feel really appreciated and you know that the passion uh that fire just keep us going right thank you jay you're the last you have the final say um yeah, for, for me, it's, um, it's getting the client um, to the next step. So I, we used to always think that uh, it's the, you, know, you need to have a big win, but we realized that design is to get you to the next step so you could get onto your next, next step or open up more doors for you. Um, so with that uh, kind of mindset in mind, the success uh, part doesn't take too much um, kind of like burden, but it's like, okay, let's focus on what gets you next. Um, and then we will take it from there. Right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for all your candid sharing and the wonderful advice. I'm sure all our listeners and the people who have attended to our session today who have learned so much from it. I'm sure that there's a lot of questions that you still have. Uh, still keep them coming into your Q&A. We'll try to respond as much as possible after this session. Meanwhile, I hand it over back to the, uh, to the DSG team. Over to you. Thanks, Ryan. And hi, everyone again. I will now be sharing with you on the Design Singapore Scholarship which supports aspiring designers, design practitioners, and design advocates in their professional development journey. The DSG Scholarship supports formal education in design to groom design leaders who strive to make things better and contribute to Singapore and the design sector. Applicants must be a Singapore citizen or permanent resident, have completed national service for male applicants and have successfully gained admission to a full-time undergraduate or postgraduate design-related course, meaning a bachelor's, master's or PhD program that is offered locally or overseas by a reputable institution. The 2021 application cycle is open from now till 19 April 2021. Next, please. Under the scholarship, there is a holistic support framework put in place for our scholars. In terms of financial coverage, it will be in these five areas. Firstly, full tuition fee and also travel allowance to cover airfare to and from the country of study. Pre-studies allowance for settling in computer and warm clothing. Developmental cost allowance for self-development programs outside of school. And living allowance to cover living expenses in the country of study. Next, please. For our scholars' development journey, we will assign a buddy from the Design Singapore Associates Network, which is the network of all DSG scholars, whether they have graduated or are still studying, and they will come together to collaborate, exchange ideas, and organize events for both the design community and the community at large. 
There is also a compulsory one month internship to be served in Singapore during studies for application of knowledge and on the job experience. On top of these, DSG will also facilitate other mentorship and job matching opportunities. Next, please. As for the bond to be served, it should be a full-time design-related role in a Singapore-registered company, whether it is an SME, an MNC with a Singapore base, or setting up your own studio. The bond period depends on the country of study and the duration of sponsorship. So if you look on the screen, in summary, a local scholarship recipient must fulfill a two- or three-year bond, and an overseas, overseas scholarship recipient must fulfill a three- or five-year bond. Next, please. We would also like to take the opportunity to share that we will be holding an online briefing session in early March to answer any questions you may have on the DSG scholarship. In the meantime, you can write to us at the email shown on the screen here to register your interest in attending. You may scan the smaller QR code on the left to capture the email details. As for more information on the DSG scholarship, you can scan the QR code on the right to visit our webpage. I will now hand the time over to Mr. Junior Lim from the Lifelong Learning Institute to share on the skills and training advisory made available by the LLI. Junior, please. Hope you can hear me. All right, so uh, thanks for uh, staying on. Uh, so I'm from, can I have the next slide, please? Okay, so uh, my name is Junior Lim. I'm from the uh, Skills and Training Advisory Unit with the Lifelong Learning Institute. Skills Future Singapore. So basically, next slide, please. What I'm here to do today is to actually share with you on a service brought to you by uh, Skills Future Singapore. So it's actually what we call the Skills and Training Advisory. So it's really the whole purpose of it is to help uh, individuals like you, Singaporeans, to really identify your skills, training needs, if you want to upgrade, upskill, or I think what the panelists have shared earlier on in terms of reinventing yourself if you are a mid-career entrant keen to move into the design sector i'm not sure how to do it well we are here to help you so what does this skills and training advisory entails next slide please so what it entails is one you will actually be able to receive uh, personalized guidance uh, in terms of advisory in terms of uh, what are your current academic qualifications? Uh, do you need any bridging courses? Or do you want to learn a new skill? What courses are available? Uh, is is, is the, the trainings available for you? And which training partner actually offers such training? Then if you are still uncertain whether design is something for you, well, the Skills Ambassadors offering the Skills and Training Advisory Services are able to help you discover your career interests and goals uh, to do a bit of what we call career planning, uh, identify the, the needs, training referrals, and of course, end of the day, to give you the right tools and resources so that you can embark on your own journey ahead. Next slide, please. So when we talk about, uh, in, a, in a nutshell, what we do, it's really your career plan. So we will help you to go through things such as uh, self-reflection, uh, goal setting, and of course, uh, develop a plan. So self-reflection is really about uh, doing a stop take in your life today. Uh, I think we are all busy rushing from day to day, work uh, commitments, uh, routines that we are all embracing. But uh, reflection is a key to success. It's not only just reflecting about your career path, but also reflecting about yourself, uh, identifying things such as your values, interests, and personality. And when you begin to understand yourself what you want, then you'll be more easily able to create a plan that suits your goals and your lifestyle. So that's where the goal setting comes in. So goal settings, of course, uh, we always talk about uh, very commonly uh, smart goals, specific, measurable, attainable, uh, re relevant, and of course, time bound. But what we are actually here to encourage in terms of goal setting is to go beyond just setting a goal, but rather sharing it, sharing it with a loved one, a friend, a buddy, or even a skills ambassador, whereby we can actually then help you, guide you, and possibly uh, nudge you along your journey ahead. And of course, having a self-reflection, you know what you want, you set a goal, this is what I wish to have, then we actually develop a plan to actually achieving that. It can be considered uh, in a more technical term. Sometimes some indivi individuals will actually say it's like uh, reverse engineering, but it's really about planning the specific steps to take 
to attaining that goal that you have already planned. And that's career planning in a nutshell. So if you really need more help, well, under the Skills and Training Advisory Services, the Skills Ambassadors are really, really here to help you. Next slide, please. So to help you travel or move into uh, the skills framework for design, uh, into the design sector, I think where Skills Region Singapore has come up with is actually a skills framework for design. So this is actually, uh, I wouldn't say uh, it's a structure, a map of the design sector, what it entails. And if you are keen to move in, what do you require to take so that it will actually help you in your journey ahead? So it offers things such as sector information, career pathways, uh, potential occupation, job roles, uh, emerging skills. And of course, if you want to upgrade yourself, who are the partners that actually help? So if you are keen to know more, you can always scan the QR code to actually download the, the PDF copy of the entire framework, and then you can view it in your own. Uh, moving on, next. So what we are also looking at is also certain skills that can cut across different sectors or different professions within the design. So what are we looking at more importantly are the portable skills and uh, the attributes. So one of the few things if you're keen to move into as a new entrant or a mid-career individual, uh, these are some of the, the attributes that uh, potential employers are actually looking at and how we tangible uh, uh, make things, uh, make uh, the creative aspects or traits tangible so that employers can actually identify it and know exactly these are the traits that you have. Next slide, please. Of course, next with the with COVID, I think there are a lot of uh, new skills, new uh, information, new skills and demand. So likewise, in the skills framework, we are also looking at the relevant skills that were cut across in the various careers in the design sectors as well. So skills such as business model innovation, all the way down to system thinking. These are actually going to be new skills or skills that is actually in demand with the respective uh, design companies that they are looking at. And these will definitely value add whether you are in the current sector as a designer or keen to move into these sectors of work. Next slide, please. So overall, under the skills framework, there are actually four key tracks that we are looking at. And most of our panel, the four the, our panelists that we had actually do fit into this. So we have the business design, innovation, and technology uh, pathways as well. To know more, do log on, uh, do download the skills framework for design and actually uh, read it up on your own. Uh, these are really resources that will actually give you a better insight and understanding into the sector. Next, please. Okay, to help you out in terms of gaining new skills, upscaling, or even reinventing yourself. So what happens is we do have something called the Skills Future Credit. As a Singaporean citizen, if you are 25 and above, you would have received at least five to a thousand credits available for you to use in your journey for upgrading. So how do you actually use it or how do you identify it? Next slide, please. My Skills Future, this is our portal uh, developed and designed by Skills Future Singapore to actually help Singaporeans in terms of their upgrading journey. So how do you want to use the Skills Future credit? What causes to take if you have identified the, the, the new skills that you're keen on, log on to the portal, the resources are all there for you to search for causes that can be used using your skills for your credit to offset the cost of it and overcome your training inertia, uh, helps you to discover yourself, explore sectors. So if you want more details on the skills framework for design, it's actually also found on our portal. Also equipping you with uh, career tips and resources to stay ahead, to prepare yourself in terms of a job application. And of course, if you are keen, it is also able to route you to our portal to look for certain uh, suitable jobs based on your skill sets as well. So this is the online version that we have in terms of resources that is ever ready, anytime you need. But if you need someone to really speak to, to really explore more, then next slide, please. Come and speak to us. We have our skills ambassadors available. We do have a free uh, 30 to 45 minute session and these are catered to you individually. 
All you need to do is scan the QR code that is on your screen right now or visit the link indicated below and key in at the last question, how did you hear about us, DSG. So we'll know that this is actually, you have actually uh, visit, uh, attended this uh, webinar and we can then actually contact you with the relevant resources and assistance to help you further. So with that being said, uh, I will hand you back over to DSG uh, to wrap up the session. Thank you, Junior, for your sharing. And thank you very much to our wonderful panel, Ryan, Crystal, Dale, Jason, and Jie Yu. I'm sure those who are present with us today have enjoyed hearing from you firsthand on your personal experiences in design roles, the exciting opportunities within the design sector post-pandemic, and the importance of career planning and continuous learning. We have come to the end of our session and we would appreciate it if you could take some time to share your feedback on the session through a quick survey by scanning the QR code on the left. And lastly, if you would like to find out more about the programs the National Design Centre has lined up for February under the theme of design learning, do scan the QR code that you see on the right. Thank you once again for spending your Thursday afternoon with us and we hope to see you at our future events. Goodbye.